Hey truthers, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have coming in from the great white north, Dan Dix of Press for Truth. Uh, he's one of my favorite, actually, indep uh, independent media journalists. Uh, he's up there, right up there with people like Luke Radowski, past Anarchast guest, and uh, he does amazing stuff. He's done about five documentaries, and he's covering, he's been covering up in Canada a lot of, uh, lot, been a lot of crazy stuff happening up in Canada, and I spell Canada with a K. It's uh, been uh, parliamentary shootings, cop shootings, uh, Canada has begun bombing ISIS. Uh, Canada is becoming very warfare-like, like the U.S. We're going to talk a lot about all of that, especially since he covers it right there on the ground. Uh, but the first thing I have to ask, Dan, is how did you become an anarchist? Well, I would say that journey began for me about four years ago is when I, I could say I first began to better understand the philosophies of anarchism. Um, that was when the G20 came to downtown Toronto and I will admittedly say that be before the G20 came I was under the propaganda spin that uh, anarchy or anarchism, anarchists meant guys who dress in black and cause some violence and go out and break windows and stuff like that and it wasn't until the G20 came to town and we saw some of the actions that took place with the black bloc who were referring to themselves as anarchists anyways and the media portrayed it as that way that's around the time that I started to learn the true meaning of anarchism and the fact that there's these so-called anarchists who call themselves that and then there's true anarchy which I ended up realizing falls completely in line with my own beliefs so it was over the course of covering the G20 um, the, the police state that descended onto Canada that I realized hey that, that's not true anarchism. True anarchism kind of falls in line with my already, my own beliefs, and, and particularly just the non-aggression principle. And, um, you know, J Jesus said a long time ago, the golden rule, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and it's pretty good advice. So I, I think the non-aggression principle is very similar, and it falls in line with my own beliefs. So I would say I embarked on that journey around four years ago as a result of the G20 in Toronto, which, by the way, we did make a film about. It's called Into the Fire, if anybody wants to check that one out. Yeah, and uh, was that the one where you caught the agent pro provocateurs, or was that a different one that you you caught that? Well, there, there, there are multiple incidents of agent provocateurs being used here in Canada, and we did document one uh, event that happened um, in uh, Montebello, Quebec back in 2007, and that was documented in two of our films, uh, United We Fall and The Nation's Deathbed. But we also did uncover some uh, police agent provocateurs being used at the G20 in Toronto, so um, we actually documented multiple incidents of this happening here in Canada in a couple different films. Um, so the, the Canadian government's been caught red-handed doing these types of things before, and we've exposed it at great lengths. Yeah, that's great. You do some great work, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about how you got into independent media and how others can as well, and I really want to promote that and and uh, let people know that uh, we really need more people like Dan Dix and, and Luke Radowski and many more like them out there at every single place uh, where anything's happening and really reporting the news. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit more about Canada and what's going on, because I found it so interesting. I grew up in, in the Great White North, and um, I remember I, I, I kind of didn't mind it too much. I, I didn't mind the Canadian people. I hate to generalize because there's, uh, I hate generalizing, but you have to generalize sometimes. And uh, in general, the Canadian people weren't too bad. They were kind of humble. Uh, they're kind of like, yeah, we're kind of all broke because of communism and, and uh, the U.S. is way better, uh, except for we have free health care. That's the one thing that they always say that they really like. But of course, it's not free and it's really not health care. Uh, but anyway, um, the one thing I liked was that they're kind of humble. Uh, they, they didn't really, they weren't like the, what I saw as being the general American. Now you look at the, what's happening today, ever since around 2000 I've noticed, Canadians have become much more like the US uh, in general. Uh, you go to a hockey game and they don't even have to sing the national anthem because every single Canadian there will be yelling it out at the top of their lungs. If you go to the Canadian version of the Super Bowl called the Grey Cup, uh, which is actually quite a bit better, I like the game a lot better, um, you see like the, the troops fly over, the jets, and and everyone salutes and they have their their ha their hats over their hearts and uh, of course we're coming up on, on uh, uh, November 11th which I believe is Remembrance Day in Canada and everyone will be wearing their poppies and thank God for the troops and um, and it's just getting worse and worse up there in those terms of much more warfare and now we're seeing this week Canada is now bombing uh, places in the Middle East which is something you wouldn't have heard about 20 years ago I don't even think they had jets 20 or 30 years ago really um, so what's your take on, on what's going on in Canada 
especially you've been covering, uh, there's been the, uh, you covered, you were on the ground in, in the Maritimes covering the police shootings. Uh, then you were on the ground at the Parliament buildings uh, a week or two ago covering that, sh that event. Uh, what's your take on what's going on in Canada right now? Well, as you said, over the last 10 years, there's been a huge shift, a, a, a massive change that's happening uh, around here, and it all falls in line with the agenda for this North American Union idea of uh, merging Canada and the U.S. and Mexico into a, a union. And that's where we're starting to see some of these things being harmonized all across the board, um, introducing uh, socialized health care ideas in the United States, while at the same time introducing privatized uh, health care ideas up here in Canada to kind of level the playing field and not only with healthcare but with our police force our security uh, we have a thing called ship rider now where American troops can enter onto Canadian soil or at least in the waterways right now is how they're going to test this one out so slowly but surely over time um, these things have been taking place and you could arguably say we are in a North American Union now um, the flags haven't been changed yet. They haven't adopted the new currency yet, but we're pretty much there. And the only last thing to, to get us kind of more in line with just how controlled the Americans are, are the notion of us being attacked by terrorists. And now over the last, I'd say, six, seven years, there's been heavy conditioning going on here in Canada to convince Canadians that the moment something happens, the first thing they think in their minds is that it was done by terrorists. And this has been heavy conditioning going on, leading on right up to a, a lot of events that have been taking place this year. As you mentioned, just recently the Parliament Hill shooting, and um, just three or four months before that, there was uh, a, another shooting. As you mentioned, this young man named Justin Bork uh, shot three RCMP officers. Now back then, they weren't calling that an act of terrorism. Uh, that, that was just murder. That was a, a, a madman who, who went crazy. But the reason why they're not jumping on it like they are now is because, well, he wasn't a recent convert to Islam. He was just a white guy who went crazy. So it doesn't play into the agenda of the Canadian government who wants to get into Syria, who wants to get into Iran, who's already began bombing Iraq. So they use this recent incident as the, the perfect excuse to take away the rights and freedoms of the Canadian people and to enter into the Middle East and to begin bombing other countries. And we're already seeing it um, within days of this attack. They put pieces of legislation on the table. One in particular is called Protecting Canada from Terrorism Act. And it gives CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, more powers to be able to track Canadians here in Canada and abroad under the Five Eyes program. Uh, it gives our immigration minister the ability to revoke dual citizenships of Canadians who they feel may be terrorists. And we have to understand that the definition of terrorism under Section 83 of the Canadian Code, uh, if you really look at it, you know, Technically, Stephen Harper himself is a terrorist because he is supporting ISIS in uh, Syria, but not in Iraq. So, an interesting um, things are changing here. Some of these bills were even on the table before this event happened. Uh, they were going under the guise of anti-bullying um, legislation, and uh, some of these things were not passed. People weren't going for it. Well, now they're trying to pass the very same things under this Terrorism Act because you know, when people are afraid, they'll accept anything as a solution, even if it means taking away their rights. Yeah, and you did a great video just recently on that, because you were covering the uh, Parliament Building shootings, our shooting, and um, it was really interesting because uh, it's so funny how things have changed in the last 15 years. Uh, it used to be people like Luke Radowski, who w was involved in the great documentary Loose Change about 9-11 uh, and what, what really happened there. Uh, they used to be sort of uh, the, the outcast. The, uh, all these guys are crazy. They're wearing tinfoil hats. And what you found after you did the parliament building thing uh, was that within minutes or hours, uh, you were having so many people attacking you because you weren't saying it was a false flag attack. So it, it's really flipped how, how much that the public is aware that they're being deceived so much that if you actually, as an independent media, don't immediately say it was for sure a false flag attack, that you will get attacked. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I have been uh, on, on, under attack lately from people because I did get there. I was on the grounds interviewing locals. 
I'm trying to speak to everybody I could, members of the Muslim community, military men, uh, locals, and because I didn't come out on day one saying this is a definite false flag, uh, some people are now considering me controlled opposition, that I am uh, gatekeeping the truth from them. Meanwhile, I didn't say it was this, I didn't say it was that. I said, guys, let's just not jump to conclusions. Let's wait until we get all the facts in here. Uh, you know, that's not in journalism when you just say something like that. That is confirming your own bias. That, you know, I didn't want to show up to Ottawa to create a propaganda piece to put out. And, you know, that's what the mainstream media does. Uh, as, as an independent journalist, I feel I need to look at all the facts before I can report on something as being 100% truth. And could this be a false flag? Absolutely. The Canadian government's been caught red-handed before. Uh, could this be a case of a, a, a deranged individual who had issues with drugs and homelessness and already had multiple problems? We know he's had contact with the police. He was arrested once back in 06. He was arrested again, I believe, in 2011. So we know there was contact. Is it possible he was coerced and, and, and set up and, and kind of incubated and, and radicalized, so to speak, to carry out such a thing? Very well could be. And, and we're still looking into all the facts here uh, before we report on whether or not there's a false flag or not. But it's very, very well could be a possibility. Um, but yes, I, I did come out and say, hey, I'm not going to say it is yet. And people jumped all over me for that one. Interesting. Like you said, in, in these times that it's turned around that much. Yeah, it's incredible, and, and that's why it's so important that we have independent media like yourself out there, uh, because as you pointed out, the mainstream media has their definite uh, agenda. You can just see it. It's not as bad in Canada as in the U.S., but it's getting pretty close uh, to being as bad. Um, and so it's so important. And so one of the things that's so great is uh, that down here at Anarchapoco, February 24th to March 1st, right on the beach behind me, uh, we're going to have Luke Radowski doing uh, Change Media University. It's going to be a one-day event where he's going to, and I think Dan and Dix is going to join us, so we're just working out the, the final details now. Um, and they're going to uh, be just sort of giving their wealth of experience. Uh, Dan has been involved uh, for more than a decade, uh, Luke as well, in doing independent media. And this is the real media. Uh, everything on TV that I've ever seen is not real, real truth media, or at least it's so heavily slanted towards one storyline of the pro-government, pro-status, collectivist, and that the that we have all these enemies around the world, they're always attacking us, um, that... Uh, uh, that uh, it's, it's so important that we have more of this. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into independent media uh, and your history in doing that? Sure, yeah, I uh, woke up, as we call it, probably around 1998-99 it was. And um, it was shortly after 9-11, I'd say probably around 2002, after just doing research for many years that I knew, okay, it's time to do a little more. It's time to get out and get active and get out into the streets. And it was around then I started handing out flyers and, and just information to people. And I did that also for a, a number of years until all of a sudden in 2006, the Bilderberg Group came to Canada. They came to Ottawa, Canada. And that was the first time that I took a camera with me to go document one of these events. And that was the moment that I knew this is it. This, this is where it's at. This is what I want to do. And I just began going to these events and bringing a camera with me, not really knowing what I was going to do with the footage, just knowing this is something that needs to be documented. And I just began uh, doing that. And it just kind of grew or organically. It evolved um, to the point where I went to a big protest in 2007 um, in Montebello, Quebec. And that's where the infamous, um, where the three agent provocateurs, police officers, were caught red-handed. Uh, wearing the same boots as the other officers when they got arrested. So we, we documented that event ex exclusively. And when we got back home and looked at our footage and we said, hey, we, we have something here. Why don't we try to take a stab at making a documentary film instead of just a 10-minute you know, YouTube video? So I didn't go there with the intention of making a film, but that's just kind of how it organically developed. And when we got back, we started piecing it together into a, into a documentary and we released that. And before I know it, I'm, I'm, I'm now making documentary films, and, and here we are five films later. And it was never my intention growing up to be an independent journalist or a documentary filmmaker. It's just kind of the natural progression of, of where it came when I took that first initial step to say, I want to do something, I want to get involved, and I, I started my own thing in 2006, Press for Truth, and it just organically evolved from there. Um, to the point now, here we are in 2014 and five documentary films later and we've uh, managed to build Press for Truth now into something where it's actually 
being able to affect the counter the propaganda coming out from the mainstream media and we're getting set to take it to a whole new level uh, in 2015 so I'll have a big announcement about that uh, early next week about where we plan to take Press for Truth in the future um, so that was it, it was a natural progression of just kind of diving in head first and taking a stab at doing this type of thing and uh, before I know it this is my career this is what I eat sleep and breathe and, and do is, is press for truth day in and day out and it, it was just all about diving in head first and taking that initial uh, that, that initial jump into it yeah that's great and uh, one thing that I hear from a lot of younger people they're like well should I go to school to do this or uh, you know how am I gonna get into something and I think one of the best ways and this is something I've, I've done many times as well is you just start doing something you just go somewhere like what you did you went to Quebec you weren't ex you were just expecting to take some videos and just see what happens and it turned out into a whole career for you uh, based on that and uh, it's also very interesting the media world is changing dramatically thanks to the internet we're seeing mainstream media just falling off of a cliff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think no one watches MSNBC anymore. I think it's like a few people. Uh, Larry King left uh, CNN because he actually went to the Russia Today propaganda channel and he actually said that uh, there's, they should actually play uh, SpongeBob SquarePants cartoons on CNN because they'd get a bigger audience. I believe last month they had uh, one of their lowest audiences ever. I believe the 27 to 54 age group, something along those lines, was somewhere around uh, which is actually the, the most uh, vaunted uh, uh, age group because they tend to buy more stuff, um, was something around an average uh, audience of 27,000 people. So people like yourself, people like Luke Rodowski, people like myself, we all have bigger audiences as a whole in general than CNN right now. So this is a massive change that people don't uh, necessarily even realize what's going on. And we're starting to see internet-based media starting to really take off. And now thanks to technology, I was just, I'm here in Mexico, we have very high-speed internet because uh, it, it's a lot better than the US and Canada because those are third world countries. Uh, but uh, w my, my wife was watching in full HD Netflix on a 50-inch flat screen look beautiful so you can get this full streaming HD now very easily we're seeing live streams uh, from people like Luke Rodowski I don't know if you've done any live streams I, I'm not mm -hmm. aware of it if you, oh, you have okay great I think those are gonna be huge um, so there's there's so much change going on in media and a lot of people think well I, I do want to be a journalist I do want to report uh, the truth to people uh, which isn't necessarily a journalist in today's terms but in independent media it is and a lot of people are thinking well maybe I should go to college for four years uh, that's crazy you're, you're not, you're, first of all, you're going to get a ton of debt, and you're not really going to learn anything. You're going to learn how news was done 20 years ago or how it's still done today, and it's basically news reading, uh, f reading yeah. off of the uh, teleprompters. Um, so what would you say to a person who uh, wants to get into uh, media today? What would you advise them? Well, take it from me, I am a living example and proof that um, you do not need to go and get indoctrinated by the state for four years to learn how to do this. Um, as you said, we have the technology at our very fingertips right now. You and I are speaking over satellites through Skype and um, no excuse anymore. If people want to get involved, you can set up a website for free. You can get a YouTube channel for free. Most of us already have cameras in our pockets right now with our cell phones. So it's because of the technology and the times we're in, it's becoming very, very more easy to get this information out there. And as you said, the old media, uh, dinosaur media is dying. Um, I think there's a huge awakening taking place all over the world. And people are beginning to realize that they are being lied to. They're, they're not trusting what they're getting from the television set anymore. And they're starting to tune in online and look for alternative sources for information and that's where the dollar vigilante comes in that's where we are change comes in that's where press for truth comes in because the people are hungry for this information so we need to, to take advantage of this time that we have right now before it's you know before we don't have the internet o operating as freely as we do now now is the time to get involved in the fight against the world uh, the new world order as I said there is no excuse we have the technology at our fingertips right now and again, this leads us back to Anarchapoco, where you know you, you can you can get involved in these workshops and learn from people such as myself and Luke Rudowski how we do it, how we get into press conferences, how we get these passes, uh, what it takes to edit a video, you know, all these sorts of things. 
uh, you'll have an opportunity to pr pick our brain about. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, and I should mention that right now is about $100 for a one-day uh, thing with Luke and, and Dan, uh, and uh, probably myself as well. I've, I've been fairly involved in media as well, so I might do a, uh, maybe a half hour, an hour on how to get involved in the media business. Um, as a quick example, of sort of a funny example, when I was younger, my mom forced me to go to college, and I didn't want to go. And uh, she said, you have to, because she believed in all these things she sees on TV and that you need a college degree or you can't get a job. Little did she know I didn't want a job. I wanted to actually do business and I wanted to uh, just, uh, you know, do things. And uh, so she made me pick one and I picked mass media. So in 1989, I show up to class and uh, the computer had really just started to come out. We had those little, those Macs with those little uh, green screen sort of things. And uh, the, the media guys, these, these were all older guys. They were in like their 60s and they, they thought they were like the best guys. They were professors at this community college in a place called Edmonton that hardly anyone's heard of, uh, except for Canadians and people who like hockey. And um, and so they're, they're telling me, oh, we're the be best guys. And I'm like, okay. And they said, oh, so now we have these computers, so we're going to start to use these a little bit for our media. And I was like, okay, great. And then they're like, they couldn't figure out how to turn it on or anything. So I was like, you guys are idiots. And then they're like, well, here's how you do a press release. And they pull out like a typewriter. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, we have computers now. And, and so they kicked me out of the class uh, because I was causing too much problems because I was basically saying, you guys don't know what you're doing at all. Like, maybe you know some things, a few things, uh, but most of the stuff you know is outdated. And uh, mm -hmm. so 10 years to the day, 1999, I was running a media company called Stockhouse Media Corporation, which was worth about $240 million on that day, so 10 years later. So the point is that uh, school uh, for these sort of things, especially journalism, uh, because what really is there to, to learn about journalism except for the things that people like Dan and Luke know, which you can learn generally in a few days and then you just have to put it into practice and learn more and more how to refine it. Um, but to, to go to four years of school, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt usually um, it's crazy and what you can do is just go and it is important though at the same time to also to uh, meet some of the people doing these things and actually network amongst those people. Uh, so for example, if you came down to Narcapoco, uh, we have, like I said, it's a one day course, uh, Change Media University. Uh, it's one day, not to four years. Uh, and you'll probably learn more in, in that one day than you would in a year or two or four years in journalist college or whatever they, whatever they teach in school. It costs $100 right now for the first two people who sign up. After that, it goes up to 150 So not very expensive at all. And then you can network and you can meet people like Dan and, and Luke and I know Luke in particular uh, he wants people to join We Are Change and, and We Are Change is a very uh, loose organization he just wants people in every city and every country around the world to be have their own We Are Change and he will help promote it so if you come up with a good story he'll get it out there and so these are the kinds of things that you can do by getting involved uh, in a different way and um, uh, like Dan said they're just it's it's uh, uh, it's everything's changed and, and it's changing all the time too so there's no point in going to this long four-year school because by the time you get out everything will have changed again um, so it's mm -hmm. really pointless and you might as well save yourself from the tens and thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt I know people who got student loans who are going to be paying off these loans for decades it seems um, people come out of this school system completely up to their neck in debt and especially in the case of journalism it's old technology it's all stuff that you can learn on your own anyways again if you just dive in head first and take a stab at actually just doing it you'll figure it out if I manage to figure it out if Luke Radowski managed to figure it out you guys can do it too and again if you come down to Anarchapoco you know $150 is fantastic you're not getting any you're not walking away with a whole bunch of debt. You're walking away with a whole bunch of knowledge that you gained from people who have been on the grounds doing this for over a decade. So I'm really excited to take part in this and I think it's it's an exciting uh, event. I mean to be able to network with these kind of like-minded people and to be able to just pick pick the brains of the people who have been doing this for quite some time uh, is exciting and um, so if you're interested I would say now's the time to get into something like this. It's a very very exciting event. I'm stoked.
Yeah, awesome. And uh, not to mention, it's in February in Acapulco, Mexico. Uh, for a lot of people up in uh, the northern climates, uh, the whole uh, global warming thing of Al Gore hasn't really been working out. It's already been snowing in many places. And, and so even that alone uh, is, is a decent enough reason. So uh, that's great, great stuff. If you haven't uh, checked out pressfortruth.ca, uh, check it out. He puts out amazing content. Uh, a lot of it is, is sort of from the Canadian perspective or, or from up whatever's happening in Canada but he does a lot of stuff. He travels around to Bilderberg and all that kind of stuff. So uh, great stuff. He puts out great stuff. So check it out. Uh, so Dan, let people know where they can get more information on Press for Truth. Sure, yeah. Everything goes to the main site, pressfortruth.ca. Um, we also have a subscription-based site, pressfortruth.tv, but we're going to be beefing that up and um, making uh, that much, much better very soon. Uh, everything goes to the YouTube channel, um, uh, youtube.com slash weavingspider. All our documentary films, all our videos go out for free to YouTube. Uh, our intention is to get the information out there. Um, so again, everything is available um, at the main site, pressfortruth.ca. That's great. And a lot of people say, how can we affect change in the world? Well, this is how you do it. And another way you can do it is just like, subscribe to these channels. Uh, a lot of people forget that's how easy it is to spread this information. For example, I can kind of see right now, I think it's right down there. I, can't, I don't know which side it is, but it'll say like 1,000 or 2,000 views and like 50 likes. And I see in the comments that a lot of people say, this is great. Well, hit like and subscribe because that's how we really get this information out there. And do the same with Press for Truth information on their YouTube videos. Uh, you don't have to go out into the streets and fight uh, violently anymore. We can actually change the world, and that's actually how we're going to change the world, is through our own minds. And by spreading this information, the more people that have access to this information, uh, the more that things will change. It's actually we're going into a digital, uh, virtual age at the moment. Uh, we don't have to go through these World War II's, even though that was total BS. Uh, but we don't have to go through violent revolutions like in France. Uh, we just have to uh, get this information out there, and through that, people will stop paying attention to the people trying to control them so much. So, so please hit like, subscribe, and, and don't forget to do that. And then share, uh, share on your Facebook page if you like these sort of messages. Um, and don't be too scared about what people think. Uh, I know that some of your family members are like, oh, this sounds crazy. Well, you don't want to put it in, in their face too much. You don't want to be just constantly all day telling them they have to get into this. Uh, but hitting a little like or a share uh, doesn't uh, hurt at all. And some people might watch this and they might go, oh, this makes some sense. And then they'll click on something else. And before you know it, they're waking up. Uh, so definitely do that. So that's it for Anarchast. And, and don't forget about Anarchopoco right here on the beach, February 24th to March 1st. We'll have all the links down below. So I'd like to thank Dan Dix, great guy, Press for Truth. Looking forward to seeing him down here at Anarchopoco. And uh, that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. This is Anarchast.